the vital question when assessing our labours for the Lord is will our work be merely an outwardly impressive structure or a genuine spiritual accomplishment? And in this address we will be considering personal attitudes in leadership that need to be embraced and nurtured, those attitudes that are essential to securing God's spiritual ongoing lasting blessing upon our labours. What better basis to assess what biblical leadership attitudes are needed for true spiritual blessing than to consider those evidenced in the leadership ministry an example of Christ, the head of the church. This is undoubtedly a vast subject, so only a sample of attitudes will be considered uh, together here this afternoon. But I do trust that the Christ-centered attitudes addressed will serve as a reminder uh, for those required in leadership and seeing also this afternoon how we can be helped uh, uh, to embrace these attitudes and to nurture them in our own personal ministry for the Lord and for his glory. And the first attitude I want to bring before you is that Christ had an attitude of wholehearted commitment. A wholehearted, committed attitude. Firstly, we see his commitment to his Father's will. We read in the account of the life of Christ, we're constantly reminded of his adherence to his Father's will. In other words, the Lord lived his life here on earth with the great objective of pleasing his Father. This is evident when at the age of 12 in the temple, Christ told his worried parents who sought him, Wist you not that I must be about my father's business? Then at the beginning of his public ministry, at the age of 30, when authorizing John to baptize him, he explained to John that this was in accordance with his father's will and to fulfill all righteousness. Significantly, following this action, God the Father approved his wholehearted obedience, saying from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus Christ, as the perfect man, always sought to please his Father in doing his will at all times. There was complete and perfect harmony between the will of the Father and the walk of Christ. He could testify, I always do those things that please him. And this was evidenced in the most profound and deep manner just before his death in Gethsemane. At which time, when his soul was exceedingly sorrowful unto death, he repeated these words in prayer. O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And the guiding factor in the Garden of Gethsemane was willing pure submission to the will of his father whatever while here upon earth the Lord considered himself to be a servant of his father in obedience to his will so how can we be helped in our own ministries to follow the example of Christ this attitude of complete committed wholehearted obedience to his father's will well, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, tells them to develop a Christ-like mindset of obedience. He says to them in Philippians 2, 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the Christ cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So we need to, with God's help, develop an obedient servant mindset, willing to make ourselves of no reputation in humility constantly cultivating this Christ-like mindset is part of our exercise in ourselves unto godliness. 
Now, there was a fundamental principle that was always evident in the committed attitude of Christ. In his unserving commitment to obedience, he always sought to bring glory to his Father. This was evidence in his heartfelt prayer, contemplating Calvary, when he said, Father, glorify thy name. And this prayer brought an immediate response from God the Father in heaven. There came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So Christ's unswerving obedience and commitment to obedience was always meant to bring glory to his father. And in so doing, his father owned and blessed him and ultimately exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name. And from this we learn that if our labours are to be owned and blessed of God, and they are to be truly spiritually fruitful, our attitude must be one of obedience to God and his word, and an unserving, unswerving, unswerving commitment to bring glory to God. Obedience to God and a desire to bring glory to God. And when our labours are undertaken in this attitude of mind and commitment, the Lord will own and bless them in his sovereign measure. A Christ-like attitude of loyalty to God the Father and the glory of God and not man is the great need of the hour. Recently, I was reminded of a Reformed Church website where the objective was so clearly and concisely stated. This is what it said. Our purpose as a church is to glorify God of the scripture in promoting his worship, evangelizing sinners, edifying saints, and showing benevolence to the needy. Note how this statement firstly started with our purpose as a church is to glorify God. And without this objective and attitude, there can be no blessing. Secondly, Christ has an attitude of commitment to the word of God. I'd like us to consider two examples of where the Lord, as a perfect man, showed commitment to the scriptures. Remember, Christ was himself the word made flesh and dwelling among us. But he constantly used the Old Testament scriptures in his ministry. His attitude to the Old Testament word of God was one of total confidence in it and commitment to it. The first example is to consider when in a time of extreme stress and severe attack from the enemy of souls, our Lord being in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights, fasting and in a state now of utter weakness physically, the devil came for his most powerful assault upon the Lord. In that stark wilderness with the beasts, with the wild beasts there, here the Lord responded to the terrible final assault of the enemy of souls by accurate use of the written word of God. Three times it is recorded, the Lord responded to Satan's assaults with the statement, it is written. And here is commitment to the scriptures. And it sets forth the example for us in leadership to follow in our smaller battles. It is written. This wholehearted commitment, attitude to the word of God. Christ's commitment to scripture is again manifest when he ministers to the two on the road to Emmaus. These two are downcast, they're discouraged, they're distressed, they're confused, they're fearful. They're wondering what the future holds. And here, the dear Saviour, Jesus Christ our Lord, came alongside them. And he simply expounded to them from the word of God, the Old Testament scriptures, showing how they all spoke of him. And the result of the scriptures applied under the power of the Holy Spirit of God was heartfelt blessing. Did not our heart burn within us as he talked with us in the way? He talked with us in the way. 
Later we read he expounded to the gathered disciples that they might understand the scriptures. And if we are to follow the Lord, if we are to have the same attitude of Christ, of Christ then we will have this attitude of obedience and wholehearted commitment to the scriptures. There is no spiritual blessing. There can be no awakening, revival and growth without a committed attitude to scripture. In the days of great spiritual blessing in the early New Testament church, uh, we can notice this of God's servant Apollos, uh, an incredibly gifted man in oratory and in communication. He was described as mighty in scriptures. He was fervent in spirit and diligent in teaching the things of the Lord. Yet, at the outset of his ministry, he knew only the baptism of John. Now, Aquila and Priscilla, two gracious believers, didn't just sit and listen and criticize him. They took him into their home and they expounded the way of God to him more fully from the scriptures. And Apollos responded wholeheartedly by submitting his ministry to scripture and developing his ministry to be Christ-centered. So he came to understand those Old Testament scriptures from their Christ-centered nature. And the point being here is that Apollos, his attitude was one of total submission to scripture. And if that meant his ministry had got to change and mature and grow and adapt and be more Christ-centered, that was the way. His ministry was molded by scripture and his God-given gift of communication was then even more greatly used. And the result was that his Christ-centered ministry proved, we read, of great blessing to those already saved by grace. He became a true teacher for souls. But not only that, we also read, he went on to mightily convince the Jews that Jesus was the Christ and the secret to his uh, 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 fruitful ministry was this total commitment to scripture. And from the example of Christ, we see an attitude of total, unreserved commitment to scripture. It formed the epicenter of his spirit-filled ministry. And when the scriptures no longer form the basis and the authority of our preaching and our practice, there remains nothing for the Holy Spirit to honor and bless in our ministry. And we build a soulless structure. As much as we are exhorted then to have a Christ-like mindset of humble obedience to God's will, we are also called to an attitude of committed adherence to scripture in our ministry. And for this to be a reality, we must develop our ministry from the word, with an attitude of submission to the word, rather than adapt scripture to suit our already preconceived intentions in ministry. We start with scripture and we develop our ministry from scripture. We do not have a preconceived ministry of our own wisdom and then try and adapt scriptural text to it. It must start from scripture. Thirdly, Christ had an attitude of commitment to the gospel ministry. If we are to follow our Lord and Master fully, the gospel will be paramount in the attitude of our minds. The gospel is to form part of the regular ministry with an attitude of commitment and respect to its message. Because the gospel of God is the power of God unto salvation. How shall they hear without a preacher? The Apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth, necessity is laid upon me. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And the Lord was totally committed himself to preaching the gospel. It was his gospel. He was the gospel and yet he preached himself. He preached the gospel so wonderfully, so powerfully. Everything in his ministry was to support this objective of the gospel. And if we are to follow the Lord, we will be gospel preachers. 
The first recorded words of the Lord Jesus in terms of his preaching ministry are centered in the gospel. We read in Luke 4, 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recover of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. The last recorded words of the Lord Jesus to the apostles in the Gospel of Mark are centered in the Gospel. So the first recorded words of Christ are centered in the Gospel, in his ministry, and the last recorded words of Christ are centered in the Gospel. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature, and he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be saved. Damned. We can also note how the apostles then responded accordingly. For later we read, and they went forth and preached everywhere. And the Lord was working with them and confirming the word with signs following. And so, for us to have the same attitude of Christ and the apostles is to be totally committed to the gospel of God. For one of the most powerful ways that we demonstrate that we are committed to God's way and we are his servants and we follow him is to serve others in preaching the gospel. And this attitude of commitment to the gospel is well pleasing to God. To help us understand the significance of this, the apostle Paul tells us that he is a debtor to the world to preach the gospel. He has a debt to the world. In other words, he is under obligation. There's no choice in this as a believer. He has no choice in it. He's under command. He's under obligation from God, the command of Christ, the Son of God, to preach the gospel. And then Christ had an attitude of commitment to the teaching ministry. In harmony with his commitment to the gospel as being the gospel of God unto salvation, Christ also was committed to teaching the truth about the Christian life. The point being that Christ was faithful in his teaching to the whole counsel of God. However challenging that counsel was, Christ taught the whole counsel of God. And following this Christ-led Example: this attitude to the whole counsel of God in his ministry, the Apostle Paul could later testify to the church at Ephesus, the elders there, Wherefore I take you to record this day, that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now in his teaching, Christ was open, he was honest about the true nature of the Christian call and the walk. It was a narrow way. And the attitude and approach of Christ to teaching about the Christian life is so different than current trends. Doctrine may be being preached, but not practiced. It could be said that there is a healthy attitude toward doctrine, but there is not a healthy attitude toward practice. There is an unhealthy attitude toward practice. Christ taught about denying self. Christ taught about a cross that had to be born. Christ taught about losing one's life in terms of selfish ambition and self and worldliness and tribulation to gain eternal life. We are given a perfect example of his commitment to teach in ministry in the Sermon on the Mount. There the Lord taught the right approach to the law, the right approach to walking with God. As our brother has read in the Beatitudes, he commenced his sermon by teaching the characteristics of a Christian. 
His approach at the outset of his message here would not be described as setting out to be seeker-sensitive, but rather truly honest. In his message, he stripped away religios religiosity, hypocrisy, pride, materialism, error, lust, envy. And he exhorted positively to holiness, to prayer, to commitment, to godliness, to building on the right foundation of his word, to following him from the heart. And so the Lord was committed in his faithful teaching on the Christian walk. No man, he says, can serve two masters. He taught that he that loves his life then shall lose it. He that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. There were other times when the Lord, in his commitment to honour his Father and preach the whole counsel of God, warned his hearers. When preaching the gospel to unbelievers, he warned about the danger of unbelief and of hell. And when teaching believers about the true Christian lifestyle, he often warned them about the dangers of hypocrisy and lethargy and worldliness. And yet at the heart of Christ's teaching ministry was a, a heartfelt understanding of those to whom he taught. On one occasion, having departed by ship to a deserted place for rest, the crowd observing this followed him. And we read that Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and he was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach there are many things. He understood the people needed teaching from the scriptures. And his heart went out to them in their need. He had a compassion for his congregation. And so when the Lord taught, his message resonated with the people. He understood their lives. We know that in the context of his understanding, he himself was tempted in all things, yet without sin. And without compromise, he had an understanding of weakness, of weariness, of temptations, of dangers. And he resonated with them in his ministry. And so for us, a humble understanding of our own weaknesses will help to make our ministry develop from just proclaiming truth to our hearers, to our hearers being persuaded by truth. In other words, touching the mind and the heart as that ministry is attended with the power of the Holy Spirit. And there can be no power without humility. There can be no power without an understanding of our own dependence upon God's grace. So Christ accomplished so much for the church simply through his committed attitude to the teaching ministry. It was this committed, faithful, instructive, helpful teaching ministry that set a pattern for the apostles to follow. And we see so much evidence of this in, in the various letters uh, written by uh, the apostles then. There is constant teaching about uh, the walk. If we read faithfully and we teach the whole counsel of God and we preach faithfully through these letters... We're going to be constantly exhorted and warned and challenged and corrected and comforted and built up in the faith. And so following the example of Christ and having the same attitude, we will preach the whole counsel of God. This will involve a ministry of comfort, a ministry of challenge, a ministry of correction, a ministry of counsel, of condemnation of worldliness, and we are called to launch out into the deep and engage ourselves by faith in a serious study and confident attitude in all the word of God. Doing so, though, with an understanding, compassion and commitment to engage with their hearers in their lives. And this is one of the great evidences that made the ministry of our Lord so different from that of the scribes. But then Christ had an attitude of commitment to the exercise of prayer. Prayer here on earth was a means of our Lord uh, that he used to commune as a perfect man with his Father in heaven. Christ valued and appreciated prayer beyond anything that we can contemplate. And from the example of Christ we know that at the beginning of his public ministry, when he was baptised, he prayed. 
The heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. And it appears from this event that the Lord was praying for the blessing and power of the Holy Spirit upon his ministry. And this event testified that he was indeed the Messiah, the anointed Christ, the Son of God, filled with the Holy Spirit for ministry. And from this we are reminded of the absolute, essential, vital importance of the blessing and the power of the Holy Spirit of God upon our own ministry. At other times we read he went alone to be in prayer to his father, sometimes early in the morning. And our own effectiveness as the servants of the Lord is affected by our own attitude to prayer, our own dependence upon it. And without this exercise, our decision-making is in our own wisdom. Our ministry is dry, it's barren. It is said when Robert Murray McShane in revival times entered the pulpit, the congregation began to weep, realizing he had come from the presence of the Lord in prayer. He had something to say for them. From the word of God, from God. And this is a world apart from the frivolous, careless manner which some worship services are commenced today. What a difference. Where would you rather be? In a meeting where the minister has come from the presence of God in prayer to give you a real message from the word of God. Or in a meeting where it's so frivolous and so casual that you have no comprehension that you have come to worship a holy God. The witness of Christ as a man of prayer inspired the disciples to ask him to teach them to pray. And so the Lord gives them a pattern for prayer. While making crucial decisions, the Lord demonstrated his committed attitude to prayer. He spent a whole night in the mountainside in prayer before appointing the 12 disciples. He set this perfect example as a man for us to follow, to be those whose attitude to prayer is most deeply respectful. Before his suffering at Geth Calvary in Gethsemane, he prayed in great agony to his father, submitting to his will. And this kind of praying is the greatest test for us in our own lives, that the will of the Lord be done. And yet this agonizing prayer of faith is well-pleasing to God. It renders us ultimately vessels through whom God can work. And how God worked through his son, Jesus Christ, on Calvary's cross. But what a preparation for Calvary, Gethsemane. Christ's commitment to prayer is described in Hebrews as being offered up at times with loud cries and tears and prayer is often in the valley of struggle and tears where we have to wrestle for the blessing where we have to wrestle for deliverance and there is another aspect in the attitude of the Lord in prayer this relates to thanksgiving when the Lord in mighty power fed the 5,000 he did so first by giving thanks in prayer to the Father when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he did so first giving thanks to the Father in prayer for hearing him. When he instituted the Lord's Supper, he gave thanks to the Father in prayer for the bread and the wine. Now this was profound inasmuch as the Lord was thanking his Father in heaven for his cup of suffering and death. That is what the bread and wine symbolizes, you know. So as he took that cup and he gave thanks to his father in heaven, he knew what was ahead of him, a cup of suffering. How could the Lord pray so? Well, he had in his perfect mind the blessed outcome of his suffering. For the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of God, the throne of God, Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you become weary and faint in your minds. You see how Christ led this example in prayer. 
And the Apostle Paul says to us in everything then, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And so from the example of Christ, we learn that for spiritual blessing, we need a committed attitude to God's way, to God's word, to preaching the gospel of God, to teaching the word of God, and to the exercise of prayer. But the second main heading I'll bring before you this afternoon is that Christ had an attitude of compassion. This means, the meaning of the word compassion in scripture is to be moved inwardly with both the mind, the heart, and the affections. It is an exercise of the soul. It's an inner being experience. It is to yearn inwardly with mercy, with affection, with empathy, with pity. And one phrase to express the ministry of the Lord Jesus. If we are to have that same attitude, he was moved with compassion. Biblical compassion, especially in the example and attitude of Christ, is sympathy inextricably linked with a sincere desire to help. So Christ not only had compassion on the multitude, he only had, not only had compassion on the lost, the compassion on those needing teaching, he then helped them. He had this desire to help them. And here is one of the vital keys to the true meaning of the compassion of love, of Christ. It is love with a working fruit. It is like love. It has a working fruit. Love is a working fruit. Compassion is a working fruit. We read of God. He is holy, full of compassion. Gracious, long-suffering, plenteous in mercy and truth. Compassion actually is a characteristic of God's sovereign grace. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And this compassion was perfectly manifest in the testimony and attitude of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And this compassionate care of Christ was so beautifully, prophetically prophesied in Isaiah and confirmed as of Christ by Matthew. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighted. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isle shall wait for his law. God the Father delighted in his Son as a servant who did not strive, did not shout or bring attention to himself. His servant who had compassion on the weak, the hurting, the bruised, those feeling at the end of all things. His servant who served him in meekness and humility, with compassion, with a care to restore and transform and bring life and hope. His servant who faithfully pressed on in the end of, to the end of his ministry, not discouraged, but intent on his father's will. It was this same attitude of compassionate meekness and faithfulness that the Apostle Paul directs us to for the purpose of both repentance and restoration. And Paul says, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So to be spiritually fruitful, having the compassionate attitude of Christ requires that we walk in the spirit and we crucify the flesh. For the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and peace and long suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith meekness and temperance against such there is no law and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affection and the lusts 
This is a daily exercise then for us to be engaged in, putting off the flesh that we might put on the right attitude. Just briefly, some aspects of the compassionate attitude of Jesus Christ the Lord. Christ's compassion for sinners. If we are to follow the example of Christ, then our attitude to the unsaved and the lost will be one of compassion. Christ was able to show compassion and concern for the lost without one iota of compromise to truth. It was this attitude of Christ to sinners, though, that drew the most criticism from the religious leaders. He was known and criticized by them as a friend of publicans and sinners because of his witness to them. How can we measure this accusation with the truth of his perfection and holiness? Well, the compassion and contact of Christ with sinners was never to compromise with them in their sin. It was rather for the purpose of bringing them to salvation from their sins through the gospel of God. Our own ministry will be greatly enhanced and helped through the development of a compassionate attitude. And this involves for us a separation from the curse of a self-righteous spirit in our ministry. And a, and a hardened attitude to the unsaved and to the backslidden. Compassion in our attitude to the plight of unsaved sinners is developed as we contemplate God's grace to us. Appreciating God's grace to us, as the Apostle Paul did, will then bring forth the fruit of compassion to those that we have to do with who need God's grace. Another way in which a compassionate attitude is developed in us to be like Christ is by an increasing hatred of sin. Hatred of sin increases as we consider the damage that sin does to sinners. It's dangerous to see it. the eternal consequences of, an un of unforgiven sin to the unsaved. And without an attitude of compassion towards sinners, our ministry will lack care, it will lack commitment, it will lack courage. And an attitude of compassion for the unsaved and the needy is one of the most heart-searching questions today. How do we extend compassion to the needy? Well, attending to the needs of the unsaved by embracing worldliness to reach them actually shows a lack of real compassion and concern for them. It is a deceitful attitude of compassion towards the unsaved because it is saying to them, your sin is not a problem. And in doing so, we undermine rather than promote the gospel. We replace it with an, another gospel which does not save. God's way is to have an attitude of compassion Evidence by preaching God's gospel in word and in action. But then, as we hasten on, I would just remind you of Christ's compassion uh, for uh, the children. You know of this well, and we were reminded of it this morning. And one of the ways that we reflect Christ's compassionate attitude is through the ministry to the children. And to reject this ministry as unimportant in our churches is to have the same attitude as the disciples who told the children to go away and Jesus Christ was much displeased. Much displeased. And this means that the Lord will be greatly displeased with our church and with our leadership if our attitude is hardened to the ministry to the children. To have the attitude of Christ is to have compassion for the children. And then thirdly and finally, Christ had an attitude of courage. Christ spoke the truth courageously and faithfully to the religious leaders of his day. Just one example of this to follow is to show that the Lord at times did use very strong language to make a point. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanness. 
Christ was rejected by them for so doing. He was eventually crucified. He was rejected. Yet knowing the outcome, he still spoke. And if we are to follow the example of Christ, there will be times when we will need to stand for the truth courageously. To be Christ-like is to stand firmly against worldliness is to stand firmly against hypocrisy and idolatry and compromise in the Christian life. Christ demonstrated an attitude of courage in cleansing the temple for the honour of his Father. He went into the temple and began to cast them out that sold therein. And then that brought, saying unto them, it is written, My house is the house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. And after that he taught, and the people were very attentive to hear him. And here again we see the evidence of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ resisted error and worldliness boldly. He was not prepared to teach in the midst of noise, in the midst of an atmosphere of worldliness in the temple. And did his actions for the glory of God have the effect of driving the people away? No, we read, as a result, the people became very attentive to hear the Lord, who acted so courageously for truth. And one of the greatest helps to, to courage in our own ministry is to understand that we serve for the glory of God. The fear of man brings a snare, whereas the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the example of Christ shows us that when the honour of the Lord's name is undermined, there is always a time to stand. Today, standing for truth and warning is sometimes described as lacking the spirit of Christ, lacking love. Whereas, when we consider the example of Christ the, and how he had such a courageous attitude in opposing error for God's glory, for the honour of his Father's name, Actually, standing for the truth is being Christ-like. If truth and the honour of the Lord is at stake, to be Christ-like is to have a courageous attitude to resist it. Well, in conclusion, the vital question then when assessing our labours for the Lord is, will our work be merely an outwardly impressive structure or a genuine spiritual encouragement and accomplishment? We've considered three aspects to the attitude of Jesus Christ this afternoon. We're called to follow him in commitment, in compassion, and with courage. And these attitudes are essential to the leadership ministry if we are to be used in the building of true churches. For the church is not the building, it's not the structure, it's not the organization, it's not the message, the method, it's not the gathering of friends. The church is a body of born-again, spiritually-minded, Christ-centered people. Sinners who have been saved by grace and are given a desire to serve the Lord in the way of holiness. To walk in the way of godliness, submitting to the word of God and seeking the glory of God. Brethren, be Christ-centered. We're saved in him. We're accepted in him. We're loved in him. We're secure in him. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And we honour and we glorify God the Father by following Christ. We come to him in Christ. And we're called to be Christ-centred. Amen.